Well, welcome. This is uh, the NYU Tisch Institute for Global Sport Faculty Roundtable. Actually, we're calling it the Chalk Talk. And the topic today is the big reset. What might the post-COVID-19 sports landscape look like? You know, we, and we've seen the cancellation of sporting events snowball after the NBA closed down its games after one of their players tested positive for coronavirus. Uh, and then many sports teams quickly followed. We saw cancellations or postponements uh, of nearly all sports events, including those as far out as July with Wimbledon, uh, the British Open, and even the Tokyo Olympics. So with that, you know, what, what, does the, what does the ultimate resumption of sports even look like? What, what might be some of the earliest events to return? Yeah, I, you know what I think, Vince, that um, sports is going to return quicker than most things. And when it comes to lots of people gathering, um, although maybe people go into the supermarket too, but um, I think that it's uh, probably events that are outdoors that are have a bit of spread to it. I know you and I talk maybe golf events, right, where there's some there's some events where you don't need, you know, you've got people that can that can share space but not are so closely together. Um, maybe things that are, you know, outdoors like beach volleyball or something like that or some uh, motorsports events. But I think uh, it, it's going to be slow for people to want to put 50,000 or 100,000 100, people into a stadium right away. And we're fastly approaching the NFL season and um, college football season. That'll be a big test. Dave, you want to? So I'll, I'll um, uh, uh, my, my kind of uh, uh, big view answer to a big reset um, is, I think it is impossible uh, to estimate how uh, the public, global public, will come back from the trauma of hundreds of thousands of deaths uh, and, and also impossible to, I mean, we can forecast it, but, but it will be difficult to understand people's, individuals, economic circumstances. Uh, and I imagine that as we've seen over the course of the last few weeks, there will continue to be an evolution of a national or global conversation about what's important and where sports, and I put quotations around that, meaning sport and sports business fits in the new set of national and global priorities, I think is the fundamental question. Yeah. And so, and so does that imply to, to any of you that, I mean, what's the scenario under which it becomes more important? Think, think post 9-11. Yeah. Uh, or, and what's the scenario where it becomes less important? I can, I can so, grab one up a little bit. I, I think when it comes to the, the more important, I think um, you know, we've had the conversations about the new normal. And I think for me, you know, the, the basketball seems to be the sport that has been the most proactive. I think David Hollander can appreciate that. I think he, him being a basketball guy, he kind of gets it. Um, the, the NBA is following what's happening in China. I think right now, since China was potentially ground zero for COVID-19, that um, the CBA in China is making a lot of headway towards possibly bringing back the game of basketball at the professional ranks. A lot of um, American-born uh, and former NBA players like Jeremy Lin, as well as Lance Stevenson, are currently going through the 14-day quarantine in China, preparing for the possible start of the CBA season or the possible restart. And um, there's a big possibility that the games may begin again for a new normal without, without spectators. I think that's something the NBA in the U.S. is considering. And I think the return to this new normal or the return to normalcy is something that people are looking forward to. Um, from a personal note, I've been watching a lot of NBA Classic 
on ESPN Classic Games, trying to trying to to relive some NBA moments because I missed the game so much. And I think a lot of them, people want to get back to a normalcy of what they would normally be doing right now, similar to what David Abrams mentioned earlier about golf possibly being the first sport because it's outdoors. It's, it's a sense of a return to normalcy. Um, so I hope I answered the question properly. Yeah, I mean, I, I think sports, is, you know, there, there's two things. I mean, this, the, the medical and uh, aspect of it, uh, notwithstanding, I think there has to be protocol set for how you move people in and out of buildings, um, make them feel comfortable that both the athletes, the production staff, the fans are, 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 are acting in a healthy and responsible way. But once those protocols are set, and that's going to be different everywhere, and, you know, the first that start those, um, I think, will lead the charge. But once that's set, I think people will be get, wanting and craving sports and um, not only uh, personal activity, but um, spectator sports. And, um, you know, the, the scary part is you, you think, like, maybe the media companies would be pushing that, right? Because they've got such a vested interest. But there's so much economy around the ecosystem of sports and so many people employed. This is a way to sort of get the economy back and, and, and moving. The question is, you know, maintaining health. And I, I agree with Dave Hollander. I think people are going to be scared, right? They're, they're not going to want to walk into Madison Square Garden or they're not going to want to go into – to, uh, you know, into it to Real Madrid and, you know, and, 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 and watch a game unless they know that they're being protected. But um, I think that you will see this evolution of what is the best practices. And once that gets started, people will fall in line. And once we've seen a rapid reduction in the amount of, of, of new cases and, and things are on the, on the incline in terms of good, the, the better, I think you'll see a rapid move or movement back to, to sports. Um, I don't think we're ever going to see it the way we saw it in the past, though. Um, this will be the year that sports died, and I don't see a, a normal happening until it's got a 2021 handle on it. Yeah, and, I, and in terms of, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, yeah, may, people may uh, uh, right now, um, of course, they, they, they long for things they took for granted before we all – uh, occupy this current state of affairs. Um, but for the business of sports to expect that it will resume uh, in ways that it was operating before in the new social consciousness um, that I believe will uh, obtain, um, in other words, super high prices to go to um, live sporting events um, um, you know, irrational expenditures of, of people's um, time and money uh, uh, toward, um, you know, antitrust exempted um, North American sports leagues. I see it, that not being consistent uh, with what I hope um, is a new way of looking at the way we do things, not just in sports, um, but across uh, all ways of, of being and transacting. Um, I, I just think we're going to be in a very different world and old models will scarcely apply. Well, I think there's been a lot of people that like to see a reset on valuations of sports assets across some of the big leagues and thought that media investment and just uh, billionaires bidding up prices was getting out of control. You know, maybe this is a way that you'll see a reset on valuation, a reset on who participates, how we consume sports, whether it moves more towards over the top and streaming or television than, and then live action. But um, there's a it, it, it's going to be different. We all know that. And I think it's going to be hard to predict what those differences are going to be. But um, I, I think that if you look at I've got a 50,000 seat stadium for collegiate athletics, and then I'm only going to allow 25,000 people into that at a time. I think that's going to be a short lived, um, uh, that, you know, that, issue. That's going, that's going on the assumption that big time college athletics even exists. Yeah, even exists. Uh, uh, I mean, you know, we're all in higher education, uh, quite close to uh, the 
you know, financial implications of all the things that are going on with students and tuitions. And uh, honestly, I mean, all the structures are up for grabs right. in terms of repurposing uh, stadiums. I, I mean, and I, you know, I mean, really, we need to have a conversation about public spaces. Uh, we need to have a conversation about like why we invest in certain kinds of institutions and, 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 and what for. Uh, at this moment, I think so many things are being laid bare uh, and you really have a be better have a really good rationale for returning to your old way of being. Yeah, I think the one I've been caught up with the most, I think, is the, the, the pay cuts in, in global sports. I think we can start with Leo Messi taking 70% pay cut. Um, I think it's easy to take that high of a percentage when he makes 90 million euros per year. Um, the NBA is also locally, sorry, domestically, the players are taking pay cuts or actually the league is considering to, to not pay them for the upcoming missed games. I think it will come out to maybe, um, I think uh, for every game they miss, it'll be one sixteenth of their salary or something like that. So I think the percentages are out there. And uh, I think as, as David Hollander mentioned earlier, I mean, the, to expect to go back to these, the old way of thinking is possibly not going to happen. And I, I'm kind of all for it, but I mean, I am an academic, so, you know, I'm not exactly a capitalist, so I think um, I'm okay with that, the pay cuts. You know, um, we're really kind of, it's interesting because we're kind of talking about this on a couple of different levels, right? Like, you know, what, what Professor Hollander is really more talking about is sort of from a meta standpoint and, you know, two years out, three years out, four years out. So, so beyond even the 18 month window, which we hear about is, I don't know if you call that worst case or not. It depends. I don't mean to imply value judgments when you say worst case, we'll call that longest case. Uh, Cause arguably the worst case is we're back to, we're back to, to quote the new normal sooner, but it's because we've, we've cost, you know, we've had a, a big peak and we've flushed the virus through more, but we've cost, uh, enormous count on lives. So let's just talk about the longer case. So in the, in the longer case, I feel like we'll come back initially a bit subdued, you know, is the word that sort of comes to mind. I don't know that we've ever, I don't know that we've got any precedent for anything that's been this pervasive. You know, and again, I referenced 9-11 a few moments ago. If you think back to 9-11, it had a profound on the ground impact tangibly to the New York metro area. And of course, a spiritual, emotional, and rippling effect throughout the rest of the United States and even the world. But, but this is where, where ground zero, which was lower Manhattan, the US is ground zero. And I don't think when it's all said and done, there's gonna be any exemptions. Um, you know, maybe Wyoming and Montana will, 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 be in a, will be in a little better situation. But in the end, we're just beginning to see the wave of this rippling through. So it, it really does force you to think as broadly as possible about what the, what the reset world, when we get there, will even look like. It's hard to even comprehend. I, you know, I, I think that, you know, and, and I appreciate Daniel's Kind of, you know, he's an academic and, and thinks about things from an academic standpoint. And I look at things, I'm certainly a capitalist and look at things from how money, where the money travels. And so after 9-11, after the uh, financial crisis of 2008-9, what we saw was um, businesses and, uh, investing, we saw banks opening up to lending. And if you look at anything, um, in, the, in the growth of sports, it has a lot to do with um, franchise value, sports value, and people willing to invest in sports. And if banks aren't lending, if money's not moving around the globe, sports shuts down. Right now, we've kind of got that situation. Even though there are a lot of banks out there that are, say they're open for business, um, credit spreads are widening cost of funds is, is higher, contractually obligated income is arguably turned off for the moment, right? So we're at a bit of a standstill. But once the spigot turns back on financially, right, the, 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 the business will, will grow again. And, you know, the question that, Dave, that you bring up is, 
you know, is that going to happen in six months or six years, right? And my guess is we never look at things the same, but banks will want to invest in sports. People will want to own sports. Um, sports will still be um, uh, an attractive asset, and that's what will get people to, to flock to it. Um, I agree that the first time I set foot into a building, I'm going to be thinking differently than I did, um, you know, for the rest for my earlier part of my life. But um, I don't think you can expect that it'll just turn off. It's going to just be different, right? And we may be consuming things differently, but um, business is going to invest in that asset, right? It may take I, a while, but they will. Yeah, I, I, um, I, uh, I think you're right that there will be a whole new way of people consuming and, and uh, uh, whatever it is they're consuming. Um, but I, I, I think if you look at the 2008 financial crisis uh, and what happened after that, uh, and here we find ourselves, um, in something that's not financial, it, it, it's a it, the the concomitant byproduct, the collateral damage is it's a financial crisis, um, but it's a uh, a medical crisis that has exposed an institutional crisis, um, and I think that you know yeah we had this financial crisis two thousand eight didn't we come back well did we. I think people are, I, I think these kinds of questions are now going to, uh, people are going to say, well, wait, what is this thing we're living in? What's the point? Is an economy a society? I do not think it is. A society, one dimension of it is an economy. Another dimension of it is, how do we take care of each other? How do we respond to emergencies? What's the point of borders? What is the, 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 uh, you know, what is our, our responsibility globally uh, as a nation to each other, uh, you know, in the environment? Uh, all these things um, are being exposed as faulty. We can't get gloves to people. We can't get masks to people. Uh, and if somebody wants to tell me that um, that's an advanced economy uh, post uh, the 2008 financial crisis, I would beg to differ. And I think many would, and I think this is the conversation. And so, you know, the, to own sports, uh, to have organized kind of ownership of sports properties, this is, uh, uh, I think, a, a really lower order of priority. Oh, I agree with you. I mean, in our in my private sector world, I mean, we all say, are we being tone deaf by even discussing the business of sports at the moment? Is it is it really critical to to the the jobs in front of us right now, which is health and welfare of the citizens? Of course not, right? Um, at some point, though, um, it will get taken up, right? And uh, it will be it will be back on the board as being important and valuable part of of the fabric of our community. It'll, it'll sports, uh, since time in memoriam, will be one of the most important things in the society. Should its manifestation be a hyper-commercialized, no. pervasive uh, uh, form is the question. Right. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think you're getting, you know, like I, I agree with you on all levels. Um, I don't know that I'm qualified to, to comment on sort of the global like ecosystem of how the world views sports, but I can tell you on a more granular level, um, businesses are going to want to invest in sports and um, that will drive a lot of the change. And it may be that, you know, businesses like, you know, making like TS, like having a TSA type uh, entryway into sports saying that you're healthy and capable of, of going into a public, uh, public domain. But think of all the leagues here in the United States, the big five leagues, how they wanted to invest globally and how the global movement of, da of money in sports has, has changed the way sports is viewed around the world. And so if the NBA is, they're vastly invested in China and India, um, and, and Major League Baseball um, around the world and, and the NFL. I think people are going to be tucking their wings in a little bit 
Um, so short term things are, uh, will be, well, maybe we need to be focused on what we have here at home because we expose ourselves to so much more by being a global business. Hard to assume that that might happen, but I think at every boardroom, it's what's the globalization of our business doing to us in increasing risk to our fans, to our business, and um, to the model that we became adjusted to. Um, those by, are the, the things I think that are happening right now. I actually, by the way, by the way ba based, based on that answer, uh, based on that, the quality of that answer, I want to hereby qualify you as a global expert. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I see, I may not be a global expert either, but I do have a good global example. Uh, 2003 with SARS in China. I mean, they were under the SARS epidemic at the time. I'm not sure if it reached pandemic levels, but they did have to rebound. They did have to rebuild and they used sport as one of the mechanisms for the rebuild. Um, you know, they, as part of their propaganda, as part of their messaging, um, a lot of their citizens wore the N95 masks to the games. It became part of their new normal. And I do think for us in the U.S., um, wearing masks in public places, wearing masks to games, that will possibly become part of the new normal for sports spectators. But I do think overall, as David Hollander mentioned, that the game will survive, that the game will continue on. But the major question is, will the focus be on the profitability or will it be on the public health and safety? I used, I've, I've, uh, I've worn masks to a lot of things in private, but uh, now everybody <laughs> needs to be. But um, uh, what I what I, I just want to uh, uh, follow, just, just slightly, Vince, on, on uh, Comrade Daniel's um, uh, point uh, on China. You know, uh, 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 sport is so important. Sport is uh, something that, uh, uh, has this, you know, reaches down uh, uh, into uh, young people and health and wellness and, and, and reaches up into like, you know, uh, the highest echelons of, of, of profiteering. Um, could we, like China and like other countries, after this, place such a high value on sport that perhaps we make it a presidential cabinet position, a minister of sport? Uh, geez, I'd like to see that. You know, it's interesting. Um, that, that could be an interesting outcome. But you know, when you use, when you use China as an example, we all, we all know it, they're coming from a very different baseline. And in 2003, post SARS, they were coming from a very different baseline culture. Uh, one where uh, sport wasn't, wasn't as intrinsic to their, you know, their, their society. Um, not that people didn't play it organically at a local level, but in terms of sport as a mega spectator uh, concept wasn't as intrinsic. So it makes me wonder that do, do, is there an evolution beyond what we've been like for our past 50 years? So maybe is it just throwing something out there, not that I'm advocating for this, but maybe is eSport the next big spectator wave? Um, especially when you look at the generational shift in fandom as well. I don't know, it could be, this could be a real boon for, for, for video gaming and esports, uh, because of the fact that they don't need to be consumed uh, in close quarters, although going to live events for uh, esports events is a cultural phenomenon all in of itself. But there's a certain amount of reach that it could have that would be, would be kind of interesting. You know, and, and that leads me to the question will sports first come back in, in this interim period, this transition phase back? in a no spectator environment? And what sports does that not make any sense for? And what sports is that perfectly plausible for in a non-spectator environment, both from an economic standpoint and from an aesthetic and an ambient standpoint? I think you take it to a different level. What, what could you expect in a non-spectator environment to, to succeed or to flourish like VR, right? Um, you know, it, the, the technology has sort of been on the edge. There hasn't been a lot of money invested into it to bring it into the mainstream. It may, in fact, now become a mainstream technology with f the advent of 5G and the ability to put, put you into the game or, or, or close to the game without actually being physically there, that, that you may see that flourish in a way. You may see a change in, in video monitors and, uh, 
and, and, and TV technology that gives you a much closer look at, 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 the, at, at the game. I think people will be investing in that. There's no doubt in my mind. I have a hard time figuring out where the spectator sports are going to flourish right away. I mean, we mentioned outdoor sports, mm -hmm. but um, I think from the most basic community level sports in elementary school and in, in high school and in college, there's now going to be the athletic department are going to be charged with how do we maintain health and fitness for our, for our kids? Not only is it important that they get physical education and, and have physical activity, but now how do we make sure they're, they're not being exposed to something they shouldn't be exposed to? So the cost of sports just went up dramatically, right? Just putting it on has just become infinitely more expensive. So Vince, you've got to figure out how do you, keep the cost down, how do you get as many people engaged um, without exposing them to um, 25,000 of their favorite friends, right? Um, and I don't think that the answer is that simple, right? It's, uh, um, you know, the, the longer it takes, like Dave Hollander says, the longer it takes people to feel uncomfortable about going into a sports facility, the more money is gonna get pumped into giving um, you alternatives. Right. You, know, th you know, 30 years ago, live attendance was the lifeblood yeah. of professional of sports, yeah. okay? We've begun to see, we're, well, we're certainly deep into the transition to broadcast and, and media, even including direct-to-consumer, being a significant way to monetize sport. Do we now go much further in that direction? And do we see... You know, I've always dreamed of the future days when we would see a 12,000 seat baseball stadium being built with maybe, you know, X number of rows and some luxury suites. And it's basically a made for TV production at that point, TV being the euphemism for whatever the broadcast medium is at the time. Yeah. So does this, you know, I, I think in so many ways, including in our, in our non-sporting lives, this event will be an accelerator. Right, the the coronavirus will 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 cut ten to fifteen years out of evolutionary changes, including things like working from home, teleworking, right? Versus, the, it, we're we're not going to be incrementally growing that anymore. It's going to take a, a step function leap. But what in within the world of spectator sports yeah. could that mean? Yeah, I I um uh, so so I I, I think um, you already saw uh uh um this happening uh, before uh, coronavirus. And what I mean is uh, the pushing against the concept of ownership in professional sports. Um, you start to see, especially in basketball, um, uh, people like Kevin Durant, people like LeBron James, uh, uh, people like uh, Anthony Davis, who began to dictate um, where they wanted to go and what they wanted to do. Um, you see the big three um, saying, we don't need that much overhead. Um, we're going to do it this way. Imagine, okay, as there's a cessation uh, or a pause or a gap um, in playing, which may be a gap uh, somewhere in the CBA. And then LeBron James says, you know what? I'm gonna take four guys. And Kawhi Leonard, you go take four guys. And we'll televise this via YouTube what do you really need uh, in terms of spectators? What do you really need in terms of overhead? Who do I really want to watch anyway? It starts to get really wide open uh, with the accessibility of media, with a, a bit of imagination. Um, and eSports, you're right, has shown us the way. Um, all you need is kind of a scroll of uh, you know, um, um, social media participants live uh, while it's happening. And man, this is a fun thing to do. You know, just to comment on that, it's very interesting because, you know, what you just spoke to suggests if that scenario comes, you know, comes into play, comes to be that um, athlete excellence and performance is supreme because that's what you just depicted. Let's just get the best of the best. But what about this element of sport that says it's an emblem of the community that I live in? So yeah, the Toronto Raptors are what's significant to me, not you know Vince Carter or Kawhi Leonard. 
or the, you know, the, the, the Chicago Bulls are what's important to me. So where does the civic and local identity and team identity rank in the, in the post-coronavirus world versus just watching excellence perform? I worry, Vince, that that, that sort of sentiment dies with our generation. Yes. <laughs> and that, you know, you look to the kids that watch esports on Twitch, where there's maybe 30,000 in a building and 2 million on Twitch, maybe that, that you know, the, the connection to the community is not the same. That's a shame. I, I'm, you know, as somebody who's built a lifetime of, inve- of, of working on community related assets, I think that that's, that's a change that we should be prepared for. Can you imagine if you didn't have to be a Dolphins fan for all yeah, those years, right? <laughs> I'll always be a Dolphin fan. I'll take that one to my to my uh, grave. Hopefully, many many years from now. But uh, yeah, it's it's interesting. I like Dave's thought that you know having a, a channel, an NBA TV channel on YouTube, where you can go to a two you know a one on one or a two on two three on three game you know you can now start watching this and it's 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 live stream people will definitely flock to that how they monetize it is a whole different story um, i'm not sure i'm ready to co- comment on that well, there's, yeah, there's, there's, yeah there's a there's a basic premise to what david Hollander was was mentioning um there's a film by steven soderberg called high flying bird which right. is you know, that, that whole premise was used as an alternative to an NBA lockout, where the players would still be able to, to own and monetize their name, image, and likeness, and to, to use it as a medium to continue playing the game they love and building their brands. Yeah. And so um, overall, I mean, the opportunities are there. And I think with a lot of the players now having – uh, social media and digital followships, followings that are larger than the teams and the, the game and overall the industry, I think we're going to see a major change, especially when it comes to pro athletes and how they can build their brands. It, it, that's not going to happen in the NFL, the biggest money maker in sports in the United States, you know, I, and, and, you know, um, all deference to Adam and um, they run a, gr- a great league. I mean, I think that their business model is a phenomenal one. I don't think you can do that with 11 on 11, right? Um, you, it's, it's, it's more complex at those sports. The NBA has a special sort of connection to its fans and, 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 its, and its players as, uh, to the fans. So maybe that works a little bit better. But it only takes one or two successful tries at something to make it work elsewhere. Um, and that's money will travel in that direction. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, um, uh, Vince, this goes back to a conversation I had with you. I don't even know how long ago about that idea of fan-controlled football. This could yeah. be the moment. That's right. It might be the moment for, for an, an invention like that of a new business model where the fans are calling the plays from the stands real time or from home. From home. Or, or from anywhere uh, on, a, um, on, on their mobile phone. Uh, from a menu of plays that are put out, they're put out there in real time. And, and the, uh, the coach is obligated to radio in the play that the fans voted on. And, and, you know, and it makes the fan the participant of the sport, right? It, 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 it marries fantasy, sports betting, and viewership all into, all into one thing. I, I have to ask, what about, um, like that. what about a situation like the XFL? Now, did, did this, you know, is, is this going to come, um, you had to hit the brakes real hard if you're the XFL. You, went, you shut down, you went dark after just a, couple, a few games, and so does the F. The XFL come back right where it left off. Has the XFL not had the momentum to get the critical mass to get over the hump, so they roll back down the hill again? I mean, what what happens to something like the XFL, a new concept for a football league? Well, their commissioner lives around the corner from me. I should go pull Oliver into the, into my house and 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 go say and and see what he would say. I think that they were incredibly successful in their first several weeks, um, much more than I would have expected. And, you know, I expect that from Vince McMahon and, and from Oliver, knowing him and having him seen him run some other successful franchises. Um, the reset button on the XFL, it starts up again, you know, whenever. I don't know. I mean, that's a tough one, right? Um, I, I think that, it, you know, when you're the sixth league or the seventh league in, in the United States, you're not the first one that's going to start up. 
but um, it's a whole lot less expensive to start that one up than it is to chart, start up the engine on the bigger league. So who knows? It, maybe they do find themselves into a position where, hey, we can easily pull it together. You know, it's, it's simple for us and um, we're ready to go. And with an America that might be crazed for, for live action sports, who knows? Maybe that's one that comes back more quickly than we thought. I mean, that's a great point, though, Vince. I, you know, I, I hadn't even thought about that. Yeah, I, I'm actually pretty excited about the XFL. I think, um, you know, the short season, but it did give us a glimpse into what it could be. Um, what was it? P.J. Walker potentially has a shot with the Carolina Panthers. I mean, you know, I think as they have those success stories of players who were, had a chance in that shortened season, but then get a chance in the NFL this fall, I think it kind of builds momentum for them moving forward to their next season. Yeah. yeah. So, so how about some, as we wrap up here uh, and wind down, how about some parting thoughts from each of you? Um, uh, perhaps starting with you, Daniel, just in terms of some parting thoughts on, on this generalized topic and, and, uh, and what you, what you're, what's on your mind. Yeah, I think for me, the, the biggest thing is, is um, a tale of hope. I think um, I'm, I'm excited for the new normal. I'm excited for, you know, the reset and the change. I think um, this time period has allowed me to, you know, really get a level of rejuvenation. It's given me a chance to, to reset on personal goals and professional goals and, you know, really centering myself with my family. And I think um, professionally in sports and sport management, I think we're all getting that same reset, an opportunity to, you know, realign the priorities. And, you know, I think David Hollander made a great point earlier when he said that we can't continue the way we've been. We can't be focused on the, on the capitalism side, as April pointed out, but more on caring about people and building community. And I, and I yeah. think moving forward, that's gonna be essential. That's great. David Abrams? Yeah, you know, I'm a big movie buff. You know, I look at like, like Wall, the movie Wall Street where uh, uh, Bud, Bud's look at, you know, his boss is saying, Bud, look at when you look into the abyss and you see nothing coming back, that's when you figure out what kind of person you are. And I think that's what we're gonna see. We're gonna see people that look into the abyss and go, I see opportunity, like Daniel said, and those opportunities may not be apparent to us right now, but I think we're in, in you know, a, a, a community, the sports community is one that's in, in, inventive, and uh, I think that we'll see the rebound. Um, I'm just not so certain that it'll happen in the next two months or three months or four months. It may be six months to a year. I'm hoping that 2021 is the road back to normal and, and investment in sports and so we can enjoy the sports. And I think, as Dave Hollander was mentioning, before we can have sports, we have to be able to enjoy what we're trying to do and health of our community is the most important. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I love what both of my colleagues have just said. Um, and I, uh, my hope is that um, this is a time of national and global alchemy. Uh, that whatever you were before, you no longer are. And you need to, we all need to see this as the moment where we move forward in shedding old labels of capitalist, uh, socialist, um, Republican, Democrat, uh, and begin to identify new ways, language. Uh, new institutions. Uh, I'm not talking about revolution. I'm talking about progress. I'm talking about a moment of pause where, yeah, we look into the abyss um, and we really try to hear in ourselves and from each other what's important um, and, and, and push this thing forward. This is, a, this is a moment for all humanity, all human history. Uh, well, well said, guys. You know, and, and I keep thinking every day now when I get up, I keep thinking back to um, the book written by Neil Howe, and I forget his co-author's name, but Generations. He wrote this book in 1992, and he said we were evolving to a point probably in the early 2020s. So he said this in 1992, where there would be something cataclysmic happening. And I had, I had been imagining this and thinking about this over the last couple of years and, and assuming it was coming out of the 
political environment we were in. But now you throw on top of that the pandemic and, and perhaps those two in, in, you know, in, in collaboration will, will really trigger um, the big reset as David Hollander most appropriately named this discussion today. And, and the one thing that uh, Howe said, and I'm not saying we should believe in fortune tellers here, but, but it is an insightful uh, uh, comment that he had and even timeline that he had, and it's based on the patterns of history. He said, we'll have some cataclysmic event in the early 20s, and it will be very, very painful on a lot of levels. And then we will be remarkably better and stronger coming out of it. And that the generation behind uh, most of us on this on this uh, uh, Zoom today uh, will be so well prepared uh, to to carry to carry forward and uh, create a new a new beginning really. So um, anyway, great conversation. A privilege to work with such um, uh, incredible faculty and and people like yourselves to to be able to have conversations organically about a topic like this. Thanks again. And uh, NYU Tisch Institute for Global Sport, Daniel Kelly, David Hollander, David Abrams. We'll talk again soon, guys. Thank you. All right, take care.